I want to start off by reminding you that the open session of this council meeting is being webcast live. And in addition, as is now our routine, the open session of all meetings of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research will be videotaped and will be made available as a permanent archive on the, on the web. And that includes both the videos of the presentations themselves as well as various associated documents. Now, for new members of council and also for new web viewers of our council meetings, I just want to make you aware there's an electronic resource associated with my director's report. It's analogous to a supplemental materials often made available with a published paper and can be accessed at the URL shown on the slide. And the slides that I'm using for my director's report are also available electronically at the site, uh, both as a PDF and also as a PowerPoint file. Now, for slides that are associated with specific documents or relevant websites, there's a document number indicated in the bottom right, which then references materials which you can then access, access at the website shown here. And so in addition to the video archive of, uh, that I mentioned earlier, this web page and all the linked documents um, will be archived on NHGRI's website, genome.gov, as a permanent historic resource. Well, there's going to be multiple other presentations um, during the open session of this council, and my director's report is tailored around these presentations, so I'll not discuss in detail the topics that others will be covering later. Uh, and specifically, in the open session uh, later, we will have uh, an update on the Genomic Medicine Working Group uh, by Rex Chisholm and Terry Manolio. And we will then have three workshop reports that have happened, uh, meetings that have occurred since the last council meeting. There was a workshop on establishing a central resource of data from genome sequencing projects that Lisa Brooks will tell you about, a workshop on sequencing and cohort studies and large sample collections that Terry Manolio will tell you about, and a workshop on integrating functional data for connecting genotype to phenotype uh, that Adam Felsenfeld will tell you about. We will have one uh, project update, an update on the GWAS catalog by Lucia Hindorf. And then Mark Geyer, the Deputy Director of the Institute, is going to give you an update on um, NHGRI and its role in the NIH Common Fund, in particular its uh, leadership role for a number of programs to give you sort of a broad view of um, our involvement in, in helping with the Common Fund efforts. Uh, at this council meeting, we will be considering one concept clearance on family history implementation in the challenging setting of routine clinical care, uh, and that will be presented by Anastasia Wise. Late this afternoon, uh, at 4 o'clock, we will uh, aim to, to have this. Uh, in fact, it will happen at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have an update on the intramural research program. Uh, this council uh, hears about our intramural research program um, roughly every year. Um, and so we'll start off by having an update uh, from our scientific director, this is Dan Castor, who directs our intramural research program. Um, Dan um, uh, could have given this presentation a council or two ago. I purposely delayed it because the intramural program was undergoing a once in a decade uh, review called the Blue Ribbon Panel Review. And uh, we're going to hear the final report from that Blue Ribbon Panel Review. Uh, Rick Myers represented uh, the council on that panel and will be giving the presentation, but he will also be joined by David Page, who will be coming in by telephone. And David Page chaired the Blue Ribbon Panel. So for the, that's what we have in store for us for open uh, session. But first, my director's report. And um, for the rest of my director's report, I'm going to cover these seven areas because I have found these to provide a very nice framework for reviewing the topics uh, that are important to go through. And I'll start off with the general NHGRI updates. But in doing so, I want to tell you that the most important update about NHGRI that I have to tell you today comes in the form of an official announcement. And while the process that got us to that announcement from concept to final approval has taken well over a year, I'm pleased to announce today that my proposed reorganization of NHGRI has been approved and will be implemented on October 1 of this year, in fact, in precisely three weeks. Earlier this morning, NHGRI issued a press release about this announcement. That press release and various other information about the reorganization is available at this URL, genome.gov backslash reorg. Because of its importance to NHGRI, I thought I would spend the first part of my director's report reviewing the key details about the NHGRI reorganization. At the present time, and really for the past roughly 19 years, NHGRI has had a relatively simple structure consisting of an office of the director, a division of extramural research, and a division of intramural research. Within the current office of the director uh, were three smaller offices, the Office of Administrative Management, the Office of Policy Communications and Education, and the Office of Population Genomics. Now keep in mind that in the case of the Division of Extramural Research, this structure was put into place entirely to support the Human Genome Project. 
But over the past nine years in particular, NHGRI's extramural research program has grown substantially, both in overall size and in the diversity of its scope. So based on knowledge from being the NHGRI director for nearly three years, I will soon implement a new structure for our extramural research program, one properly aligned with the strategic vision for genomics research that we published in Nature in February 2011, and one that I think better configures us for our ongoing and our future research agenda. So my plans for reorganizing NHGRI aimed at making major changes to our extramural research program, some minor changes to the components of the Office of the Director, and essentially no changes to our intramural research program. Now, the new organizational structure for NHGRI, which takes effect on October 1, will grow the number of divisions within the Institute from the current two to a set of seven. Specifically, the Office of Administrative Management will be elevated to division status and be called the Division of Management. Similarly, the Office of Policy, Communications, and Education will be elevated to become the Division of Policy, Communications, and Education. Those two new divisions will thus form from elements previously in the Office of the Director. Meanwhile, the Office of Population Genomics will dissolve in name, but the elements of which will be incorporated into the extramural research program, as you will see shortly. The Division of Intramural Research will not change as part of this reorganization. The most substantial aspect of the reorganization will be the creation of four new divisions that together will constitute NHGRI's extramural research program. The Division of Genome Sciences will oversee basic genomics research and technology development. The Division of Genomic Medicine will promote the Institute's effort to advance the application of genomics to medical science and clinical care. The current Office of Population Genomics will be subsumed into this new division. The Division of Genomics and Society will be responsible for an expanded program related to the many societal issues relevant to genomics research, incorporating and extending the activities of this Institute's Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications, or ELSI, research program, and working to integrate the many NHGRI-wide activities in these areas. Finally, the Division of Extramural Operations will manage the myriad operational aspects of the Institute's extramural research program, including scientific reviews and grants management. So, in the end, NHGRI will consist of seven divisions, each with a division director that will report to me as NHGRI director. In this way, the extramural research program will no longer have a single director as it has since its inception. Rather, the four division directors of the extramural divisions will serve as a collective leadership team working closely with me and the NHGRI deputy director, Dr. Mark Geyer, in leading the extramural research program. Now, getting to this announcement today has not been particularly fast uh, because there were a number of specific steps that had to be followed to reorganize the Institute as proposed. Specifically, we followed the guidance given in the NIH Reform Act of 2006 in terms of the process for carrying out such a reorganization. As some of you may recall, this involved holding two public meetings during which we detailed our proposed reorganization, answered questions, and took feedback from participants. The first of these was held as a webinar on January 18th, the second as part of this, the meeting of this council on February 13th. Following those public meetings, we put together a final reorganization package and submitted it to NIH leadership in late February. Upon receiving NIH approval, the NIH leadership in turn sought the approval of the Department of Health and Human Services. In fact, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius herself signed off on our reorganization in late June after which the Office of Management and Budget, as well as the U.S. Congress, were notified. Having received no objections from those latter two groups, we then actually crossed the approval finish line, and this allowed us then to announce the reorganization today and then to implement the reorganization on October 1st. Now, key to the success of this reorganization and indeed the future pursuits of NHGRI will be the leaders within the new structure. And so today, I'm also pleased to announce my outstanding new leadership team. Now, for three of the divisions, there will be essentially no change. Janice Mullaney will be the director of the Division of Management, just as she is now the director of the Office of Administrative Management. Dr. Laura Lyman Rodriguez will be the director of the Division of Policy, Communications, and Education, just as she is now the director of the Office of Policy, Communications, and Education. And Dr. Dan Castor, who you'll be meeting later today, will continue to be the director of the Division of Intramural Research as he is now. The real changes occur with the four new extramural divisions. Now, for three of these four divisions, I have selected the directors and deputy directors, all longstanding members of the NHGRI extramural staff. Their actual appointments should take effect once we get final approvals, 
which are expected shortly. Leading the Division of Genome Sciences will be Dr. Jeff Schloss as Director and Dr. Peter Good as Deputy Director. Leading the Division of Genomic Medicine will be Dr. Terry Manolio as Director and Dr. Brad Osenberger as Deputy Director. Leading the Division of Extramural Operations will be Dr. Betty Graham as Director and Dr. Rudy Pizzotti as Deputy Director. In the case of the Division of Genomics and Society, I am formulating a plan to search for its director. Until that search is completed, this division will be led on an acting basis by Dr. Mark Geyer, who all of you now know, of course, as the Institute's Deputy Director. Now, finally, to round out this reorganization, I will also be making some changes in terms of senior advisors. Effective October 1, there will be three senior advisors at the Institute. Dr. Jane Peterson, who has long been the Associate Director of the Division of Extramural Research, will become a Senior Advisor to the NHGRI Office of the Director, while she will work closely with me and Dr. Geyer. Vince Bonham will be my Senior Advisor on Genomics and Health Disparities, and Karen Rothenberg will be my Senior Advisor on Genomics and Society. Now, an issue that has frequently been discussed internally and that was raised during the public meetings uh, related to the oversight and execution of individual extramural programs and projects in light of the new multidivisional organization of the extramural research program. So I thought I would say a few words about our plans for this. Well, the three programmatic divisions, in genome sciences, genomic medicine, and genomics and society, will be organizationally separate. We plan to continue having programs and projects overseen in a highly collaborative fashion, in most cases involving staff from more than one division. For example, our flagship genome sequencing pro program will draw on expertise and personnel from all three divisions. Similarly, an area like computational and biology and bioinformatics will be highly relevant to all three divisions involving personnel from each of those divisions. There will be programmatic areas such as the biology of disease, one of the major domains of genomics research in the coming decade. And again, this will require the involvement of staff from all three divisions. And one can imagine the same to be true for the other, uh, both current and future programs and projects. Now, while the details about this intersection between programs and divisions uh, need to be worked out in the coming months, we are all fully committed to maintaining the highly collaborative and cross-disciplinary nature of the NHGRI extramural program something that has set us apart for many years and that must be preserved. So in summary, this is an incredibly exciting time for genomics research, and I believe that NHGRI has the right strategic vision to continue leading the field, as it has done for the better part of two decades. Implementing this new organizational structure is an important step in NHGRI's growth and evolution, and one that will better position the Institute to pursue our expanded mission and also to deliver on our, on our exciting strategic vision for genomics. So that's the official announcement I wanted to make, and now I will return to the remaining portions of my director's report. So at the May Council meeting, uh, we announced a new collaboration with the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History to develop an exhibition on genomics and the human genome. That exhibition will open in 2013 to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project, as well as the 60th anniversary of Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. The roughly 2,500 square foot high tech, high intensity exhibition will aim to communicate the revolutionary nature of genomics, and this will be augmented by a multifaceted educational and outreach programming, which will include significant web development efforts. The goal of the overall initiative is to reveal and communicate the current and future implication of genomics to millions of people around the world. Now, the exhibition development is moving along quite quickly, passing the 35% design phase in July. The project has an advisory committee, which includes Jim Evans as a representative from this council. The Foundation for NIH and the National Museum of Natural History continue to raise funds for the initiative with over half of the roughly needed five to six million dollars now in hand. At the February council meeting in 2013, I'll have much more to report about the lead up to the opening of the exhibition in June of next year, as well as the broader plans that we're developing to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Human Genome Project's completion. Well, while it does not happen often, NHGRI extramural program directors do on occasion retire, and Elizabeth Thompson has departed NHGRI to enter into the land of retirement, more accurately in her home state of Iowa. 
Elizabeth contributed her considerable clinical expertise and experience to the LC research program for 20 of the program's 22 years. She was the driving force behind many LC program initiatives from the successful and influential cystic fibrosis and cancer genetic studies a research consortia of the 1990s through the current Centers of Excellence in LC Research, or our SEER program. She remembered most, though, for her passionate support and generosity as a mentor to trainees and young investigators. We all thank Elizabeth for her many contributions to NHGRI and to the field of genomics and wish her the very best in her retirement years. As you may recall, NHGRI co-sponsors a policy fellowship with the American Society of Human Genetics, ASHG, and each September, a new fellow joins that program. The newest such fellow is Dr. Laura Kuntz, who started in the NHGRI Office of Director last week. Laura comes to us from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. She'll be working in the NHGRI Policy and Program Analysis Branch for the next four months before progressing to the next stage of her fellowship to be in a to-be-determined congressional office. It is notable that this month marks the 10th anniversary of the launch of the joint ASHG NHGRI Fellowship Program, and it continues to be successful for providing a bridge for early career genetics professionals wishing to transition to careers in science policy. The last of the NHGRI updates uh, relates to me. Um, in early August, I traveled to Australia uh, with the goal of learning more about genomics, the genomics research landscape down under. Uh, this was similar to a trip I took to India uh, last summer, and I once again found it extremely valuable to learn firsthand what other countries are doing in genomics, in particular in the applications of genomics to medicine. Uh, my trip was largely choreographed by my good friend and colleague and genomicist, Dr. Simon Foote, shown here, who actually recently became dean of a new medical school at Macquarie, uh, Macquarie University in Sydney. Uh, for me, it was a five-talk, four-city, five-day romp around Australia. In addition to Macquarie University, I visited the Garvin Institute in Sydney, the Institute of Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, and the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne. Importantly, I also spent a day at the National Health and Medical Research Council, the N NHMRC, in Canberra, which is Australia's equivalent to the NIH. Uh, there, I met with Dr. Warwick Anderson, shown here, who's the CEO of the NHMRC. For my discussions with Warwick and his staff, which I spent several hours with, as well as my numerous meetings with scientists throughout the week, it became very clear uh, that Australia is very active in genomics with a vision that is similar to the U.S. about the future of genomics and medicine. Now, many of you say, well, I hope you saw the outback. You got out and saw a lot of things. Well, no, there was no time for seeing any sites outside of research institutions. But I admit that in a very jet-lagged state, just off the airplane, and immediately upon my arrival, I snuck away to the Sydney Zoo for a few hours and took pictures, uh, you know, capturing at least a few pictures of Australian icons, such as this little guy shown here. Okay, so that was where the NHGRI updates. Let me move on to NIH updates. And out of respect, I'll start at the top. When you start at the top, you usually talk about awards. Now, Francis Collins. Uh, re uh, will receive the 2012 Pro Bono Humanin Award from the pre Gallian Foundation. This award recognizes exemplary and innovative efforts in improving the human condition. And the Foundation Board selected Francis as this year's honoree for his founding leadership of the Human Genome Project. And the award will be presented at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City in October. Sticking with the Francis theme, in June, Francis was featured on the cover of a popular Capitol Hill publication, CQ Weekly. Now, this is not to be confused with GQ Magazine. That's a whole other story. <laughs> now, it's actually quite unusual, uh, and I actually think quite good, to have the NIH director prominently featured on a publication that gets con considerable congressional attention. Interestingly, the main thrust of the featured article was to point out how Francis is describing NIH to congressional leaders these days. Quote, not just as a powerful force in the war against disease, but also as an incubator of new jobs and new products. In short, he is stressing over and over again the role that the biomedical research uh, can play in boosting the U.S. economy. It also, the article went on to report how Francis is stressing to Congress that the U.S. is falling behind other countries, such as China and India, when it comes to medical research budgets. It quotes him as saying that since the completion of the Human Genome Project, quote, we have basically ceded leadership in genomics to other places, and particularly to China, end of quote. Also worth highlighting is this editorial that Francis published in Science during the summer that stressed his views about the role of basic science in the overall NIH research enterprise. 
Now, with much attention over the last couple of years focused on advancing NIH's clinical research and therapeutic de development agenda, some have expressed concern about perceived erosion of NIH support for basic science research. So in this editorial, Francis restated a strong commitment for the NIH basic science research portfolio, uh, which actually continues to garner the majority of NIH research funds. Among his many good points, Francis reminded us in the editorial that, quote, Americans need, Americans need to know uh, that today's basic research is the engine that powers tomorrow's therapeutic discoveries. Moving on to other parts of NIH and related to NIH, the foundation for NIH will soon be getting a new leader. And in November, Dr. Maria Ferrer will become the president of the foundation for NIH. She is currently the president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation, a position she has held since 2008. Maria is well known to us at NIH, having served as the director of the NIH Office of Technology Transfer from 1995 to 2001. She's also an internationally recognized expert in technology commercialization, as well as a strong champion for biomedical research. Many of us at NHRI look forward to working with Maria upon her arrival at the foundation. Also announced last week, Dr. Janine Clayton has been appointed the new director of the NIH Office on Research on Women's Health, or ORWH and also an NIH Associate Director for Research on Women's Health. Dr. Clayton has served as the Acting Director of that office since August of 2011. Prior to this, she had been the Deputy Director of the office. A board-certified ophthalmologist whose research interests include immune-mediated diseases and the role of sex and gender in ocular health and disease, Dr. Clayton served as the Deputy Clinical Director of the National Eye Institute prior to coming to the Office of Research on Women's Health. Of great interest to NHGRI, the search for a new director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, NIGMS, is active again. Uh, in fact, the initial cutoff date for applications is October 1. Story Landis, who's the director of NINDS and, and I, are co-chairing the search committee. Now, because of the important collaborative opportunities between, between NHGRI and NIGMS, uh, we should all, and I literally mean we should all, be highly motivated to identify an out outstanding candidates for this important NIH leadership position. So please send me any ideas you have about individuals that the search committee should contact. Um, again, the initial deadline, October 1. And similarly, please encourage people you know who might be good candidates to please apply, or if they have questions, they can feel free to contact me directly about the position or about NIGMS. Well, three working groups of the advisory committee to the NIH director recently completed their work, delivering reports and recommendations to the NIH director in June. Now, in all three cases, significant attention is now being paid by the NIH leadership and the institute and center directors in terms of addressing the recommendations. I'm going to tell you about each of these three reports. Now, the first of these is the Data and Informatics Working Group, which tackled the challenges associated with scientific and administrative, quote, big data. That is, the increasing needs in computational biology, bioinformatics, informational sciences, and so forth. This is obviously an area of great interest to NHGRI and to this council. The report includes five recommendations. One, promote, promote data sharing through central and federated catalogs. Two, support the development, implementation, evaluation, maintenance, and dissemination of informatics methods and applications. Three, build capacity by training the workforce in the relevant quantitative sciences, such as bioinformatics, biomathematics, biostatistics, and clinical informatics. And four, develop an NIH-wide on-campus IT strategic plan. And importantly, five, provide a serious, substantial, and sustained funding commitments to enable recommendations one through four. For those of you interested, the full report is available as document eight. Now, as I've mentioned to council previously, I and others at NHGRI have been asked to take on significant leadership responsibilities with respect to developing a trans-NIH plan to address these recommendations and to tackle the many challenges of scientific and biomedical big data. This is now very active for us, and I am certain that I'll have more to report to you in terms of our progress um, in uh, trying to deal with the recommendations and developing a path forward um, at February council meeting. I'll have more to say about that. Now, the second working group, the Biomedical Research Workforce Working Group, was charged with developing a model for a sustainable and diverse U.S. biomedical research workforce that can inform decisions about training the optimal number of people for the appropriate types of positions that will advance science and promote health. The overall purpose of the working group recommendations is to ensure future U.S. competitiveness and innovation in biomedical research. 
They include specific recommendations for different stages of the career path, including graduate students, postdoctoral trainees, staff scientists, physician scientists, and faculty. The recommendations deal with length of training, skill sets needed for various career options, salaries, economic and educational drivers, diversity, which is actually mainly addressed in a different working group that I'll tell you about in a minute, and the coordination of training, information collection, analysis, and dissemination, and advice for increasing specific funding programs already um, being supported by NIH. Again, the full report, if you're interested, is available as document eight. And then the third working group, uh, the Working Group on Diversity and Biomedical Research Workforce, was formed to look more deeply into the issues raised in the 2011 publication by Ginther et al. on race, ethnicity, and NIH award research awards, which uh, reported poor success rates for extramural applicants from underrepresented groups. The working group was charged with analyzing the NIH intramural and extramural research community's retention of underrepresented minorities, persons with disabilities, and persons from disadvantaged backgrounds in the biomedical research for workforce. They were asked to focus on five key transition points in scientific careers. In the end, the working group gave uh, NIH 13 recommendations to enhance the diversity of the biomedical workforce. Three of those recommendations, just as examples, were to one, enhance data collection and evaluation of training program outcomes, two, to strengthen mentoring and career preparation and retention programs, and three, to conduct pilot interventions with outcomes monitoring. And again, the full report of this um, is available as document eight. Uh, moving on then, uh, you may recall that just over two years ago, NIH was blocked uh, from funding any human embryonic stem cell research as a result of a court case brought about by Drs. James Shirley and Teresa Deischer against the DHHS Secretary Sibelius and the NIH. The injunction against NIH funding embryonic stem cell research was lifted by the appeals court when Judge Royce Lambert found in favor of the NIH in July of 2011. In late August of this year, the Court of Appeals considered the case and also ruled in favor of DHHS and NIH, hopefully bringing this case to a close. Moving on to next year's appropriations, um, in July, Senate and House leaders announced an agreement on a continuing resolution that will fund the government and keep it running through March of next year. Legislation will still need to be passed this month to make this handshake agreement a reality, but it therefore looks like we're likely going to not know until spring at the earliest what NIH's and NHGRI's fiscal year 2013 appropriation will be and that the final decision will be made by the next Congress, uh, not the current one. Now, the appropriations committees in Congress had previously been working on legislation allocating fiscal year 2013 funds for NIH and NHGRI, as shown on this table. In July, the House Labor HHA subcommittee approved a bill that set NHGRI's fiscal year 2013 funding at $512 million. One month earlier, the Senate Appropriations Committee approved a bill setting our funding marginally higher at $513 million. But since the regular congressional appropriations process will not be completed until the next Congress, it is unclear how these bills will translate into final appropriations for NIH or NHGRI. So as expected, with the pending election, we know very little about what our funding will be for the fiscal year uh, that starts in about three weeks. Uh, speaking of Capitol Hill, on July 21st, um, Francis Collins testified before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health at a hearing entitled the National Institutes of Health, a review of its reforms, priorities, and progress. Uh, the oversight uh, hearing did not focus on a major issue of concern of the committee, but rather touched on a wide range of topics. These included the implementation of the 2006 NIH Reform Act, the progress of NCATS, and the determination of NIH funding and research priorities. Moving on then to genomics updates. We'll start with some award, an award. So NHGRI grantee Steve Quake was awarded the 2012 Lemelson MIT Prize for Biomedical Discoveries and Commercialization of Inventions, Revolutionizing Human Health. He was recognized for his invention of microfluidic chips that have miniature pumps and valves that incorporate complex fluid handling steps to speed genomics research. It's always fun to embarrass a council member, so we'll do that here. Amy McGuire, a council member, and also an NHGRI LC grantee and, an, and a, and a microbiome, human microbiome project grantee, was recently named the new director at, of Baylor College of Medicine Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy. 
Amy has served uh, on the Baylor College of Medicine faculty since 2004 and is Associate Director of Research for the Center since 2009, and her research focuses on legal and ethical issues in genomics. Congratulations, Amy. Joanne Boffman, who's here to my right, announced in June that she'll soon be leaving the American Society of Human Genetics, ASHG, where she has served as Executive Vice President since 2001. And she, Joe's going to become the Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University System of Maryland. Now, because of Joe's leadership at ASHG, NHGRI has developed an outstanding collaborative relationship with the Society in innumerable ways over the past decade. Joe has also served as the ASHG liaison to the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research for many years. Um, ASHG is advertising for her successor, and applicants can submit their name to the ASHG website, and the deadline for such a submission is September 15th but I won't change slides until I personally thank Joe for the wonderful relationship we've had with her and for all the contributions she's made to genetics and genomics, and we wish her the very best in her new position. As you may recall from the February and May Council meetings, the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues has been considering bioethics issues raised by advances in human genome sequencing. The Commission is focusing on issues related to access to and individual privacy protection for genetic information with a focus on large-scale human genome sequence data. The Commission will address and provide recommendations regarding these issues in a report due to be published in October. The Commission has gathered information for its report through a request for information and through a survey of federal agencies on their relevant statutes, regulations, guidance documents, and policies. The Commission also held a series of public meetings the most recent of which was held on August 1st and 2nd, where Dr. Laura Rodriguez of NHGRI presented on behalf of the NIH about privacy and other participant protection measures integral to the agency's genomic data sharing activities. NHGRI staff remains in contact with the Commission staff, both to serve as a resource and to provide appropriate input when needed uh, to the Commission. The lawsuit over Myriad's BRCA patents and possibly gene patents altogether continues to move around the court system with a new decision announced last month. As you may recall, the case began in 2009 when several pathology societies as well as several clinical pathologists and breast cancer patients challenged the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and Myriad Genetics and the directors of the University of Utah Research Foundation over the patentability of Myriad's BRCA1 and BRCA2 related patents. A couple of years ago, a federal district court ruled that Myriad's claim to BRCA pat genes were not patent eligible, and this decision was reversed by the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The case was then appealed to the Supreme Court. However, in March of this year, the Supreme Court asked the Court of Appeals to reconsider the case in light of another longstanding biomedical patent dispute between Prometheus and Mayo Laboratories. The Court of Appeals has now issued a new ruling coming to the same conclusions as before, with the majority finding that Myriad's claim to the isolated BRCA genes were still patent eligible. The case is now expected to be appealed back to the Supreme Court once again, thus the depiction of Lego men playing ping pong. NHGRI continues to feature a Genome Advance of the Month on our website, genome.gov. Publications that were featured since the last council meeting described research addressing genetic and epigenetic changes in cancer cells, manipulation of DNA to form useful shapes, results of the Human Microbiome Project, and the genomics of aging. And as always, genomics was featured in many news stories over the past four months. For example, the press really enjoyed reporting about the sequencing of the banana genome. As you can see from the headline, quote, a smart bunch of scientists unpeel bananas genome. And to quote, the study actually discovered several genes that might be involved in pest resistance and ripening. The New Scientist published a piece about the use of exome sequencing to uncover the genetic causes of rare diseases, both before and after the detection of symptoms. And a genome-wide association study published by Nature identified a genetic variant in multiple sclerosis patients associated with a negative response to drugs commonly used to treat other autoimmune diseases. But those stories were really just warm-up acts for a significant amount of attention paid to genomics in recent months, and in fact, even today, uh, by the New York Times. For example, Gina Collada co authored um, a three-part series looking into the use of genomics in diagnosing and treating cancer. Part one addressed work done to uncover the genetic basis of a case of acute adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia using exome and RNA sequencing. 
They discovered that a normal gene was an overdrive producing a protein that appeared to spur the cancer's growth. As a result, a treatment was identified that put the patient into remission. Part two of the series described the experience of a patient with a rare T-cell lymphoma who underwent whole genome sequencing. The results indicated that her cancer was driven by a strange gene aberration that could be attacked with a new drug approved for melanoma. While the patient eventually succumbed to the disease, this treatment seemed to have halted or reversed the patient's cancer for a few weeks, illustrating the potential power of this kind of approach. Part three described the use of a genomic test that predicts the outcome of patients with ocular melanoma. The test assesses the activity of 12 genes associated with the disease, the results of which can identify those patients that are likely to respond well to treatment. And just last month, another piece in the New York Times described the work of Dr. Ed Marcotte and colleagues who used human yeast comparative genomic analyses to identify drugs potentially applicable to the treatment of cancer. And because of their shared evolutionary history, they found that an antifungal drug that affects cell wall development in yeast can be used to inhibit the growth of blood vessels in human tumors. So moving beyond genomics and specifically to the NHGRI extramural research program. And it seems appropriate to start with our genome sequencing program. Recall that there are four components of the recently renewed NHGRI genome sequencing program. The large scale genome sequencing and analysis centers, centers for Mendelian genomics, clinical sequencing exploratory research projects, and informatics tools for high throughput sequence data analysis. Each of these components will be discussed further in the following slides, but it's worth noting that for the first time, participants in all four of these components will be having a face-to-face -face meeting in October. In addition to the necessary housekeeping tasks, we hope that the attendees of this meeting will pursue shared goals and discuss common obstacles and engage directly about their different scientific objectives. Well, starting off with the large-scale genome sequencing analysis centers, they're undertaking numerous projects, mostly related to complex disease and cancer. Notably, in February, the Obama administration announced new efforts to fight Alzheimer's disease, including making an additional $50 million of existing NIH funds available for cutting-edge Alzheimer's disease research. Accounting for half of those funds, the Large-Scale Genome Sequencing Analysis Centers program is in the late, late planning stages for a significant Alzheimer's disease genome sequencing project in collaboration with the National Institute on Aging and its grantees. In the most recent quarter, the three centers in this program produced an impressive 57 terabases, that's trillion bases, of sequence data. Also worth noting are a number of publications emanating um, from these centers since the last council meeting, including those related to cancer, autism, rare diseases, human microbiome, clinical sequencing, and methods and reference development. And ongoing projects are focused on cancer, complex diseases, rare diseases, and comparative sequencing. Specifically emphasizing cancer, uh, of course, all these centers are involved in the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, which now has data available on 22 different tumor types, and major progress has been made with respect to publishing their results. A TCGA paper uh, reporting uh, work uh, to analyze colorectal carcinoma was published this summer in Nature. Notable findings included the observation that colon carcinomas and, re and rectal carcinoma are not distinct diseases, at least with respect to the results of genomic analyses. Confirmation of the involvement of MIC, signal MIC signaling in these cancers was also reported, as well were numerous amplifications of the PI3 kinase pathway genes, which suggest potential therapeutic targets. A TCGA paper about lung squamous cell carcinoma was released online by Nature yesterday. This report reveals why therapeutic strategies used for the more common lung adenocarcinoma often fa fail for squamous cell disease. A much different spectrum of tyrosine kinase regulars were found to be mutated in the squamous cell carcinomas, pointing to new options for directed therapy targeting these regulators. I point out driving in this morning on the listening to the radio, listening to the news, this was one of the featured stories, uh, was this report. And indeed, they talked about a New York Times article. In fact, Gina Clotta has an article that came out today uh, reporting the results in this paper. Again, the drumbeat of good uh, stories about genomics continues in the media. Um, a paper describing TCG analysis of breast carcinoma will also be published soon. And several other manuscripts are in preparation, including those reporting studies of kidney clear cell carcinoma and acute myeloid leukemia. This last study is being led by Council Member Rick Meyer, uh, Rick Wilson, wrong Rick, Rick Wilson. 
Registration recently opened for the second annual TCGA Scientific Symposium, which will be held on November 27th and 28th in Crystal City, Virginia. Following the success of the first such symposium last November, this meeting will feature talks on the ongoing TCGA tumor projects. They'll include hands-on sessions on how to access and use the TCGA data, multiple poster sessions, and the opportunity to interact with investigators generating TCGA data sets. Also involving the three large sequencing centers, progress continues on the 1,000 Genomes Project to sequence the genomes of a large number of people, thereby providing a comprehensive resource on human genetic variation. The 1,000 Genomes Project analysts are now working on the development of methods for identifying variants, especially indels and other structural variants, and integrating them on haplotypes. These new methods will be used to analyze the final data set of about 2,500 samples from 25 populations which should be generated by December and which should then be analyzed next year. But meanwhile, the phase one paper, which characterizes the variation in the first 1,092 samples from 14 populations, will be published in early November. In fact, it will be published in time for the ASHG meeting. Moving on to the next component of our sequencing program, the three centers for Mendelian genomics at the University of Washington, Yale, and Johns Hopkins Baylor aim to discover the genetic basis of as many Mendelian disorders as possible. This program is co-funded by NHGRI and NHLBI. More than 100 Mendelian diseases have been selected so far, and appropriate samples have been or are being sampled, sequenced and analyzed by the three centers. A number of disease genes have already been identified, with some papers reporting these discoveries already submitted or are in preparation. The American Journal of Medical Genetics recently published a commentary uh, describing the goals of this program. The commentary states, quote, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics will provide exome and whole genome sequencing and extensive analysis expertise at no cost to collaborating investigators where the causal gene or genes from Mendelian phenotype have yet to be uncovered. Over the next few years, and in collaboration with the global human genetics community, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics hope to facilitate the identification of genes underlying a very large fraction of all Mendelian disorders, end of quote. To accomplish this, joint sample solicitation um, uh, is, is taking place for all three centers, um, um, but it's coordinated through a single web portal at Mendelian.org, which has started receiving samples now. And finally, the centers have organized an educational program focusing on Mendelian genomics at the 2012 ASHG meeting, which takes place in November. The third component of our sequencing program is the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Projects, or otherwise known as the CSER projects. And they're now up and running, and the consortium of CSER groups will be expanding. There was a strong response to the reissued RFA for the CSER program, and these applications um, will go to study section this fall, and then will be discussed at the February Council meeting. Recognizing the relevance of this area for their institutes, uh, NCI and NIDA, the Drug Abuse Institute, have tentatively agreed to support awards relevant to their missions. You may recall that NCI co-funded two awards in the first round of CSER projects. Applications were also received for a coordination center to assist both the CSER consortium, but also the Return of Results Consortium. We anticipate that this coordinating center will have a crucial function in disseminating the important findings and best practices coming out of the two consortia. And the fourth and final component of our sequencing program, recall that a new component consists of a network of grantees involved in developing informatics tools for high throughput sequence data analysis. This IC tools network, as it's called, aims to develop robust and reliable analysis tools that are researcher friendly. The six funded IC tools projects are now out of the gates and already making advances in building better tools across the stages of the software lifecycle from prototype to hardened. This includes building more robust software with important new features, building user interfaces, and better engineering. There will also be the establishment of more user support, documentation, outreach, and new community forums and portals. These useful analysis tools are being linked in workflows to simplify their use. Software will be re-engineered to be more efficient and to do more with less compute and memory. New cloud and virtual machine approaches are also being piloted. So stay tuned for more updates on this program at future council meetings. Well, last week was an insanely good week for the ENCODE consortium with an impressive flurry of publications and an avalanche of press coverage. Uh, specifically, uh, ENCODE was featured on the cover of and throughout the September 6th issue of Nature, including the consortium's main integrative paper and also a supplementary poster. 
shown there. In addition, there were 29 other ENCODE papers published last week in Nature, Genome Research, Genome Biology, plus additional papers in Science, Cell, and the Journal of Biological Chemistry. These papers add to the greater than 150 papers already published as a result of funding for this phase of ENCODE. Nature has developed four publishing innovations for these ENCODE publications. These include <laughs> one, threads that connect findings by themes across the various papers. Two, interactive figures that allow researchers to click on figures and then drill down to see additional findings. Three, virtual machines that allow computational scientists to view detailed materials and methods. And of course, four, an iPad app, how can we not have an app, that contains all the papers from the package across all the different publishing houses and also all the above add-ins. Well, uh, congratulations to the entire ENCODE consortium and to the NHGRI ENCODE program staff for these remarkable contributions. Uh, but they did not go unnoticed, and shown here is just a sampling of the press coverage. Um, you can see in some high-profile uh, press, uh, quite an impressive set of articles. I'm only showing you four of about 40 such articles that were, that were written about uh, ENCODE last week. Now, uh, the model organism encyclopedia of DNA elements, or mod ENCODE project, aimed to use a variety of experimental and computational approaches to catalog all the parts of the fruit fly and worm genomes that play a role in biological processes. And as this is the final year of the project, <coughs> NHGRI held a special symposium at NIH in June to celebrate Mod ENCODE accomplishments. At the symposium, Mod ENCODE consortium members showcased their findings and highlighted the power of model organisms to enhance understanding fundamental biological processes, including the biology of disease. Uh, the symposium was a great success, and videos and slides for all the talks are available on NHGRI's Genome TV channel of YouTube. In terms of programmatic aspects of the ENCODE project, our fo focus has now been on launching the third phase of the project. For this, three ENCODE RFAs were issued in October 2011 to support research projects that applied high-throughput, cost-efficient approaches to extend ENCODE resources towards its complete catalog as feasible. Awards for this next round of grants will be made by the end of September. And finally, publication of cross-species analyses are being planned for the Mod ENCODE and Mouse ENCODE consortia. One set involves integrating worm, fly, and human data, and the other involves comparisons of human and mouse data. There was a strong response to the new SEER RFA for Specialized um, Center, P50, and Exploratory Center, P20, applications with applications received in July. Our current plans are to fund two P50 and two P20 applications. Those applications will be reviewed this fall and will then be discussed at the February Council meeting. The eighth annual SEER investigators meeting and training workshop will be held here, I mean literally in, in this room here, on October 15th to 17th. Panel discussions will include an examination of the transition of LC research to policy, the evolution of transdisciplinary LC research, sustaining SEER training activities, and a discussion of late-breaking legal and intellectual property developments. Over the past few months, um, NHGRI has issued four RFAs in the area of genomic medicine that are worth highlighting. The Genomic Medicine Pilot Demonstration Projects RFA for Study Sites and Coordinating Center, which had a receipt date of July 19th. The Population Architecture Using Genomics and Epidemiolo Epidemiology Page Phase two RFA for study sites and coordinating center, which had a receipt date of October 18th, and the clinically relevant genetic variance resource RFA, which had a receipt date of October 23rd. And finally, the genomic sequencing and newborn screening disorders RFA, which is co-sponsored uh, by NHGRI and NICHD and has a receipt date of November 19th. Finally, some NHGRI meetings that I've not already mentioned include the SAGS annual grantee meeting, which will be held at the University of North Carolina in October, and at the 2012 ASHG meeting, which I've already mentioned several times, ENCODE and the Common Fund Epigenomics Program will be holding a joint outreach tutorial on November 9th that aims to teach participants how to use their data resources to understand genetic variation and human disease. And speaking of the NIH Common Fund, let me give you some updates about Common Fund programs and projects, starting off with Molecular Libraries Program, MLP. Molecular Libraries Program um, is now in the fifth year of its production phase. This is actually the eighth year of the program overall, which represents its penultimate year. 
As such, the ramp down in funding has started and the network has been reduced to five centers. A total of five comprehensive and specialized chemistry centers remain, which will be funded at reduced levels next year. The Bioassay Research Database, or BARD, envisioned as both a repository for MLP assay data and an analysis tool for the broader community, is under development by a team comprising multiple participating institutions. Public beta release of this tool is scheduled for this spring. And while the primary mission of probe development continues, the network is also planning for transition as the program ends after year six of the production phase in a little over a year. So program staff is working with center PIs and assay providers to identify routes for future institute and center-based support. And a coordinated effort is also underway to define the legacy of the program through a high impact network publication. Moving on to the Human Microbiome Project, the Human Microbiome Project reached an important milestone uh, similar to what ENCODE had last week with a flurry of publications. Uh, in their case, these publications happened in June. Particularly Nature published two major consortium papers and featured this on their cover, shown here. And at the same time, 18 associated papers came out as an open access PLOS collection. Among the findings reported, researchers were surprised to discover that the distribution of microbial metabolic activities matters more than the species of microbes providing them. In the healthy gut, for example, there's always a population of bacteria needed to digest fats, but it may not always be the same bacterial species carrying out this function. Meanwhile, several papers in the PLOS collection reported medical results. For example, researchers at the Baylor College of Medicine examined changes in the vaginal microbiome associated with pregnancy, while researchers at the Washington University in St. Louis examined the nasal microbiome of children with unexplained fevers, a common problem in children under the age of three. The set of HMP papers received an extensive amount of press coverage once again, due in part to the excellent efforts once again of NHGRI's communication team. Coverage included articles run by multiple wire services, including AP and Reuters, and over a dozen dailies, including Boston Globe, LA Times, New York Times, and Washington Post, by multiple international outlets, science publications, and business magazines, as well as an appearance by me on the PBS NewsHour. On Twitter, the hashtag microbiome reached 74,000 within hours of the news announcement. I guess that's good. Um, um, uh, meanwhile, there was a late-breaking session on these microbiome publications at the American Society of Microbiology meeting in June. The Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project, COMP2, is in the second phase of an initiative that aims to create a public resource comprised of phenotype mice containing a null mutation for every gene in the mouse genome. In five years, COMP2 aims to make and phenotype 2,500 live mouse strains from knockout ES cells. COMP2 awards were made in fiscal year 2011, with overall funding for the program being $111 million over five years. Three centers proposing paired mouse production and mouse phenotyping applications were ultimately funded. The graph shown here shows program progress to date. Note that the early phase has emphasized the generation of the mouse strains themselves following uh, microinjection, which is mostly on track. Uh, the phenotyping of those mice kicks in uh, later this year, so we'll start tracking the goals of this component, which are shown in pink. Uh, in the near future. The Genotype Tissue Expression, or GTEx project, uh, was approved for a scale-up um, with money from the Common Fund, uh, and that approval came in May of this year. So there will now be two and a half years of active enrollment with 25 to 30 tissue samples collected from each post-mortem donor. With these additional funds, GTEx now aims by 2016 to generate an ultimate resource involving 900 post-mortem donors with associated clinical and histopathological information who will be fully genotyped. Gene expression levels will be measured by RNA-seq for greater than 20,000 tissue samples collected from 30 organs. These data are being released through quarterly dbGaP data releases. The resource will also provide access to stored samples through an RFA currently scheduled for 2014. Um, and GTEx also includes an ELSI study of the donor families. The NIH Protein Capture Reagents Program held a productive teleconference with its external scientific um, panel this past July to provide a program update. The NIH particularly sought guidance from the panel for improving the capacity of the Antigen Production Center. Based on the feedback from this meeting, we submitted a half a million dollar supplement request to boost antigen production, and this request was approved by the Common Fund. 
So the three production centers continue to work collaboratively to exchange technology and protocol ideas to generate the best possible products. And it's anticipated that this extra funding will restore the antigen production pipeline and keep the affinity centers on course to achieve their production milestones. The three production centers will be site visited in February by NIH staff and external scientific panel members to assess progress. Finally, a website is now live on the Common Fund Protein Capture page as an outreach effort to seek public comment on a priority list of human transcription factor targets for production of a renewable affinity reagents. Um, moving on to hu Human Heredity and Health in Africa, H3 Africa project. This program has been busy preparing for its official launch. Um, the NIH and the Wellcome Trust Awards were released in August. With those awards now announced, there'll be an inaugural meeting of the H3 Africa Consortium um, in Ethiopia in October. The meeting will bring together over 40 African scientists representing more than 10 countries. At that meeting, we will have the official press announcement of the NIH and Wellcome Trust Awards. Also at that meeting will be presentations by the new grantees, as well as discussions about various H3 Africa policies, such as data release, resource sharing, and consent and implementing the H3A BioNet, the Bioinformatics Network, and the H3 Africa biorepositories. Um, now that uh, the program is underway, an independent expert committee has been assembled to advise the program. That new group will be comprised of scientific experts from the UK, from the United States, and from Africa, and will be co-chaired by Barry Bloom as the NIH representative and Kay Davies as the Wellcome Trust representative. Council members Rex Chisholm um, and uh, Carlos Bustamante have also agreed to serve on the Independent Expert Committee, thanks to both of them. The H3 Africa program continues to expand. A new, RF, a new FOA for the H3 Africa ELSI program was released in June, and FOAs for H3 Africa collaborative centers, research projects, and biorepositories were reissued in August. Uh, getting H3 Africa off the ground has not been a simple process. It involved a tremendous amount of work, a collective effort of many people across NIH with a particular concentration of those people at NHGRI. And in a recent ceremony, Francis Collins honored those people by giving an NIH Director's Award, award in the area of global health to a group that included the core team of individuals that have made H3 Africa a reality. Well, in the, the last Common Fund um, program I want to tell you about is something I've told you a lot about in the past. And in multiple director's reports over the last two years, I've spoken about the NIH Undiagnosed Diseases Program, or UDP. Founded by NHGRI's clinical director, Bill Gall, this trans-NIH program has been highly successful and also highly acclaimed. Run out of the NIH Clinical Center within the NIH Intramural Research Program since 2008, the UDP aims to assist patients with unknown disorders reach an accurate diagnosis and also to discover new diseases that provide insight into human pathology and genetics. The program has served as a referral of last resort, if you will, for patients whose conditions have failed to yield a diagnosis. In terms of numbers, the UDP has received 6,500 inquiries to date. It's reviewed 2,300 medical records and then accepted about 500 patients for further study. A definitive diagnosis has been reached for about 39 patients with rare diseases, and 16 new human genetic disorders have been identified. So far, the UDP has been a pilot program with funding committed only through this fiscal year. And after months of discussing and debating the best long-term funding arrangement for this obviously important and valuable program, NIH leadership decided to move the UDP into the NIH Common Fund. So starting in fiscal year 13, um, in other words, on October 1 of this year, the UDP will be a common fund program. Not surprisingly, NHGRI has been asked to play the major role in overseeing this new common fund program since it had existed in our intramural program uh, administratively and programmatically up until now. So I've been designated the co-lead along with Story Landis from NINDS and Steve Groff of the Office of Rare Diseases Research. In its new configuration, Bill Gall will continue to lead an intramural UDP effort. In fact, that existing program will play a pivotal central role in a planned expansion to create a national UDP network. That network is envisioned as adding roughly six new extramural sites, groups that would build on the foundation created to date by the intramural site. 
In creating such a network, data storage access and analysis will be improved and expanded, and there will be plans for training and fellowship programs for rare disease diagnostics. Uh, we will have uh, many things to discuss with Council at future meetings, but immediate next steps to make you aware of include an active request for information um, to solicit information about this expanding uh, UDP program. There will also be an investigator webinar and then a public webinar in the coming weeks to gain more input about these exciting new plans. So that's what I want to tell you about the Common Fund. We move now on to the Office of the Director. Uh, the Genomics in Medicine Lecture Series, a collaboration between NHGRI, Suburban Hospital, and Bethesda, and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine has been a success and has now been extended through January 2013. As you may recall, each presentation is a grand round style seminar covering topics in genomic medicine. Um, Dr. Gene Passamani is now leading the planning committee for this series. And these talks occur the first Friday of each month, with the next one being given by Max Munka of NHGRI on November 2nd. And shown here are some of the additional speakers for future talks into 2013. Importantly, for those of you not local, all of these talks are being videotaped and made available on NHGRI's Genome TV channel of YouTube. Last month, NHGRI held the 2012 Summer Workshop in Genomics, otherwise known as the Short Course. This year's participants included 28 biology and nursing school faculty and 12 pre-doctoral students from two and four year colleges. Participants came from diverse universities and colleges across the country. As always, the lectures were provided by researchers and staff from across NHGRI. A major effort was made to develop a unique experience for each group who attended the workshop. For example, nursing faculty had the opportunity to learn more about the G2C2 resource, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Graduate students participated in the NHGRI Summer Internship Program poster session and met with intramural research faculty. And biology faculty participated in a bioinformatics 101 course offered by the NIH library. In June, NHGRI hosted a follow-up meeting to the November 2011 meeting of stakeholders in pharmacist education. The June meeting was designed to specifically address the potential use of NHGRI-developed Genetics and Genomics Competency Center, G2C2, by pharmacist educators interested in advancing genomics education. The small group of leaders included representatives from the major professional and educational organizations. A commitment emerged to use the G2C2 tool by the organizations. In addition, there was a commitment by the organizations to evaluate and revising current competencies for genomics education, which included establishing a committee to review the competencies included in the accreditation process for schools of pharmacy, which will undergo an update in 2013. Gene Jenkins will be taking over for Greg Firo's leadership of this effort going forward. Speaking of Greg Firo, um, in June, Greg Firo co-chaired an Institute of Medicine Genomic Medicine Roundtable meeting on assessing the economics of genomic medicine. Specifically, the meeting explored the economics of integrating whole genome sequencing in clinical care. This event was a sequel to a 2011 IOM meeting that explored the full spectrum of issues facing the introduction of genomic data into healthcare. The meeting used three case vignettes spanning a period of time in a patient's life to explore how clinical care might change with the availability of genome sequencing data. Stakeholders representing the perspectives of a provider, of a researcher, and a patient were asked to discuss how having sequence information might affect healthcare delivery. In the end, several major needs were identified, and those included the need for formal methods for valuing personal utility of genome sequences, the need for scalable economics evaluation methods for large number of variants in genes, and the need for more robust outcomes research for modeling economic scenarios. The proceedings of the work shall be will be published over the next few months. Another meeting in June, uh, NHGRI convened a meeting to get input from the for Genetics and Genomic Nursing Competency Initiative Group. The aim of this gathering was to review available evidence of whether or not nurses who incorporate genomic information in practice make a difference in patient outcomes. The meeting concluded there was, there was minimal such evidence, and so recommendations to guide nursing research were drafted and posted for public comment. These comments are now in, and the next steps include a joint meeting with the leadership of the National Institute of Nursing Research to review the comments and then the publication of final recommendations in 2013. NHGRI is looking forward to the potential of building new collaborations with the National Institute of Nursing Research in this area. 
NHGRI very recently launched a new digital media database, which is a publicly available resource. The NHGRI digital media database is an easily searchable database that containing downloadable high resolution photographs, graphics, and video files related to the field of genomics research and the activities of NHGRI. Uh, these images are all in the public domain, so we wanted to facilitate their use by all of you, by the community, and so we developed this database uh, and made it freely available. So we welcome you to poke around the various parts of the site and use uh, images and videos and so forth for your talks and presentations and uh, provide us uh, feedback about the utility of this database. And finally, uh, let me just tell you a few things about our intramural program. You'll be hearing far more about it later in the open session. Um, and another big media blitz, uh, a lot of good, uh, public interesting publicity. Uh, the research highlight from the NHGRI intramural research program that garnered the most media attention since the last council meeting related to a paper published in Science Translational Medicine. Um, using the Next Generation Genome Sequencing, Julie Segre's group at, and the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center tracked a serious outbreak break of antibiotic-resistant Klebsiella pneumoniae in the NIH Clinical Center shown in the photograph. The novel insights provided by whole genome sequences from multiple isolates of the bacterium helped to establish precisely the path by which the infection spread in the clinical center, leading to changes in some of the practices for containing such an outbreak. This was a fabulous example of genomic technologies being used in novel ways for improving the practice of medicine, which is why literally dozens and dozens of news stories reported the findings. Other recent highlights from the NHGRI intramural research program included Les Biesecker's group, uh, published a study in the American Journal of Human Genetics that examined how available genome sequence data from patients can yield clinically useful information about cancer susceptibility genes. Pam Schwartzberg's group published a paper in the journal Immunity reporting the use of a mouse model of X-linked lymphoproliferative syndrome to establish how a missing protein can disrupt communication between T and B cells. Their findings explain why some patients with this syndrome can encounter a fatal immune response to Epstein-Barr virus. In a collaboration with investigators at the National Institute of Mental Health, Ellen Sudransky's group published a paper in the journal Brain reporting the results of a six-year study explaining how people with alterations in the gene mutated in Gaucher disease are more likely to develop Parkinson's disease. And finally, and I told you, there's always highlights about the Undiagnosed Disease Program. Once again, it's true. And finally, you just can't go four months without something major. This time it was CBS's 60 Minutes that aired a story about the UDP. Uh, correspondent Laura Logan interviewed members of the UDP team, including Dr. Camilla Toro, shown here, in a piece they called Hard Case, which was filmed uh, entirely at the NIH uh, Clinical Center. And with that, I, of course, want to thank, as always, Chris Waterstrand, who helps pull together all these many slides and all these bits of information that I, so I can report it to you. But also thanks to Larry Thompson, uh, Judy Wyatt, um, and all the rest of the NHGRI web team and communications team who are busily doing all sorts of things um, to get this report out, available, and videotaped, and available sort of as a public resource as well. So I will stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Questions? Okay. What about me? I need to come over. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. He tans better than me. So we have one more thing coming up, if we can get it up quickly. Doesn't like it again. Should we just go on without the slide? Yeah, you might just yeah. need to improvise. So, well, um, Eric doesn't know about this, I don't think. Um, in the, uh, Eric was uh, willing to embarrass uh, a council member or two. We're willing to embarrass Eric. Uh, just to uh, add to the director's report that uh, Eric, in July, Eric was awarded the 2012 Wallace Coulter Lectureship Award by the American Association of Clin Clinical Chemistry. Uh, this award recognizes an outstanding individual who has demonstrated a lifetime to commitment to and has made important contributions that have had a significant impact on education, practice, and or research in laboratory medicine or patient care. 
and uh, we want to congratulate Eric. Be suspicious when someone's trying to load a slide. I don't know about. So, Eric, yeah. Eric, just a technical question. That that workshop in November 9th, on November 9th, where you, ENCODE is, and and the epigenome are doing that. Is that similar to the one where you pair up the the? Uh, it, it's not the same thing as we. No, you're thinking of when we had ENCODE participants paired up with. Geneva, right. oh, Geneva investigators. My understanding, although an ENCODE person can jump to a microphone, Mike, my understanding is that th this is a tutorial style workshop for a typical ASHG attendee to teach them how to use the resources of, en of ENCODE and the Common Fund Epigenomics Project data. Yeah. And that really just was, I, I didn't think that was what it was. Are you going to do something like that pairing again? Is that, has that been uh, um, discussed? I just don't remember hearing about it. So for on the first question, the, the tutorial will be classroom style. Um, there will be some practical going through how to access the data, how to use the data, but it will be primarily lectures for the people. Um, do we have a plan for a follow-up to the ENCODE Geneva? We don't have a planned event at this time, but we think that was really successful and we'd be looking to those opportunities, sure. We're always looking for ways to get people to use the data more. And expand it beyond Geneva, I think, right? I mean, that was the... <laughs> right, the yeah. Yeah, the, the pairing up with Geneva, that was a specific opportunity that presented itself rather than we thought that that was the uh, most important group to target. I just wanted to ask a question if you wanted to, as part of the sort of common fund and also uh, the undiagnosed diseases program, if you wanted to comment at all on the current status of the clinical center and how things are going on the intramural program in terms of that that as a, acting as a hospital and uh, it's, it's, its utilization, its funding, et cetera. So, uh, so I think it's a great question and I would be happy to take a stab at it, but knowing that Dan Kastner is coming here at 4 o'clock and will be talking about the clinical center and has, as you well know is sort of a, not only a champion, but a, you know, has made his, Dan's made his career in the clinical center. He's, he, he will give a far more sophisticated answer than I can give, and I think it's a better context as part of his presentation. So I can prime him, but you should just ask him if I don't do that. Anything else, general questions, comments? Okay, so we're going to sneak one more thing in here before lunch. Um, um, as you will recall, uh, we uh, form working groups of the council uh, in areas that we want additional um, input about. And um, so some couple years, I forgot the exact date, but a year or two ago, we created a new working group in genomic medicine. We did this uh, specifically with the new thrust of the strategic plan, and we recognized that area was something we were going to be involved in. We wanted to have additional activities uh, that would lead to input to us. And so a formal working group of the council was created. Um, and we're, we've heard about it, you've heard from RFAs, that have, but now we're gonna, you're going to hear an actual update about the activities of that working group. Rex, Ch I think it's going to be a tag team event. Rex is going to start, and then at some point in the middle of this presentation, he's going to hand it off to Terry Manolio. <laughs>